important to us because you know we are able to come and and draw sustenance and ask God to shield us from from challenges of life uh, and and this this means is making wave is making waves all over the show all over the country and we are grateful for that we thank God because the center of of our prayer ministry is is nothing else but prayer without wasting a lot of time I'm going to ask uh, Pastor Benjamin to to take over thank you Fundis Good morning, Saints. It's a pleasure to be with you uh, once again this morning. Uh, let me get straight into it uh, today. Uh, yesterday, our uh, chapter of concentration, contemplation and consideration was the second Samuel chapter 11. And just like yesterday, today, you are going to need your Bible. So go there. Uh, we're going to recap reviews to, to set the foundation for where we're going this morning. Now, you need to notice Know and note that in 2 Samuel chapter 11, the word sent or send appears 11 times. In fact, you cannot faithfully and accurately retell the story of David and Joab and David and Bathsheba and David and Uriah without using the word sent. But don't just take my word for it. Take your Bibles and turn in your Bibles to 2 Samuel chapter 11. In verse 1, we see that David sent Captain Joab into battle because David hadn't gone into battle himself. In verse 2, David saw a naked woman bathing. And in verse 3, sent for somebody to tell him who this naked woman was. In verse four, knowing now that this naked woman was Bathsheba and Bathsheba was the wife of Uriah, David still sent his servants to bring Bathsheba to him. David and Bathsheba then have some illicit and explicit time between those royal bedsheets. The result of these lay activities is found in the following verse. Come with me and stay with me. I, I know where we're going. For in verse five, Bathsheba sent the message to David that she was pregnant. David had panicked. And this is reflected in the next verse. For in verse six, it is recorded and David sent to Joab saying, send me Uriah the Hittite. And Joab sent Uriah to David. After David failed in getting Uriah to go home to sleep with Bathsheba, verse 14 reports that David sent Uriah to Joab with his own death sentence. In verse 18, Joab is preparing to have a message sent back to David. Now watch this. The reason why Joab is preparing his messenger to present this message to David is because Joab is fearful that David will react and respond negatively to the report. Uh, soldiers had been killed in battle, not only Uriah, but others too. In fact, Joab instructs his messenger not to tell the good news of Uriah's death until David first hears the bad news of the death of all the other soldiers. Uh, Joab surmises when David is angry with the bad news, you can then calm him down and pick him up with the good news. And so in verse 22, the sent messenger relays, recalls and reports to David all that Joab had instructed him to say. In verse 27, the last verse of 2 Samuel chapter 11, after David had learnt that Uriah was dead, after Uriah's wife Bathsheba had mourned for seven days, David sent for her to be brought to him and David made her his wife. Understand that the word sent in this chapter, 2 Samuel chapter 11, demonstrates David's use and abuse of power. That was 2 Samuel chapter 11, but today we're looking at 2 Samuel chapter 12. The first verse records, and the Lord sent Nathan unto David. 
God had revealed to Nathan the prophet that David had tried to control and conceal his sin, but now God sends Nathan to convince and convict him of his sin. Nathan had been sent to deliver a divine directive of disapproval to David the king, and so just as Joab was very careful and calculated in delivering bad news to David, Nathan must also be strategic strategic in his approach in sharing this bad news with the king. For if the prophet accuses David of sinning, David's just going to deny it. He, he'll act defensive. He'll contend and contest. He'll debate and dispute. He'll quarrel and squabble. There'll be no way of getting through to him. There'll be no way of him admitting and confessing and repenting from his sin. And so Nathan determines and decides to approach David as a judge, requesting for his verdict. He'll tell him a parable so that he is not prejudiced to absolve himself from judgment. He'll speak his language, for he was not always a king or a judge. He was once a shepherd. And so we can read the parable that Nathan told David in 2 Samuel chapter 12, verses 1 through to 4. If you're there, I'll read it. The Bible says there were two men in one city, the one rich and the other poor. The rich man had exceeding many flocks and herds, but the poor man had nothing save one little ewe lamb which he had brought up and nourished up, and it, it grew up together with him and with his children. It did eat of his own meat and drank of his own cup and lay in his own bosom and was unto him as a daughter. And there came a traveler unto the rich man, and he spared to take of his own flock and of his own herd to dress for the wayfaring man that was come unto him, but took the poor man's lamb and dressed it for the man that was come to him. Nathan tried to speak David's language. He talks about flocks and herds and little lambs. Uh, whilst David is no longer a shepherd of sheep, as the king of Israel, he is the shepherd of God's people. You must understand that in this culture, custom and context, wealth was measured primarily by the number of livestock a person possessed. And so the contrast is between a rich man who has many flocks and herds and a poor man who has just one sheep. It's a small sheep. It's a female sheep. It's the only sheep that this poor man has. But he bought her and fed her and nourished her and nurtured her. This little lamb rightly belongs to this poor man. She was a part of his family. In fact, this poor man considers this little lamb his daughter. Now, I know you don't get it because it was lost in translation, but the Hebrew word for daughter is Bart. Just like Bart Sheba. Something has just been subtly suggested in this story that just as this lamb was wrongfully taken, Bathsheba was wrongfully taken, but David doesn't get it yet. This little lamb eats, that's number one, the poor man's food, uh, drinks, that's number two, from his cup, and sleeps, that's number three, in his arms. And Nathan not only tells David of the attention and affection that this poor man gives to his one and only little lamb but the prophet reminds the king of Uriah's response to David when David tried to get him to go home to sleep with Bathsheba Uriah responded you got to see this for yourself in 2nd Samuel chapter 11 verse number 11 saying shall I then go into mine house to eat that's number one and to drink that's number two and to lie that's number three with my wife Uriah ends his response to King David in this verse by pronouncing an oath. As thou livest and as thy soul liveth, I will not do this thing. But David still doesn't get it. And so in this story to King David, the prophet Nathan says, a traveler had come to this rich man's house. Now, according to the custom, the rich man must show hospitality to this guest. Uh, 
What a better way of getting to know this stranger and meeting the needs of this stranger and making this stranger feel at home than to provide for him a cooked meal. This is a kind and considerate gesture, but instead of providing the meat from the meal or for the meal from his own flock, this rich man catches and snatches, he pinches and poaches, he takes and steals the one and only little lamb from this poor man. This is the slaughter of his daughter. Now Nathan can see that David is not happy. His fists are clenched. He shakes his head. His face turns red. He wears a frown across his brow and he rises from his throne and renders his ruling as the Lord liveth. The man that hath done this thing shall surely die. David's indignation induces him to interrupt Nathan's speech. David has just sworn an oath. He's not only pronounced his judgment as judge and king, but like Uriah, he's made a commitment before God. Uriah had committed himself to God, meaning he did not go down to his house, resulting in his untimely death. Now, David unwittingly commits himself to God, not knowing that it will result in his own death. The irony that David made Uriah carry his own death sentence, but now David declares his own death sentence. David hasn't finished yet. He goes on to say in verse six, and he shall restore the lamb fourfold because he did this thing and because he had no pity. Now we must commend David as a judge for he knows the law. According to the law of Moses in Exodus 22 verse one, if a man shall steal an ox or a sheep and kill it, or sell it, he shall restore five oxen for an ox and four sheep for a sheep. This very law is applied by Zacchaeus in Luke 19, verse 8. There it reads, And Zacchaeus stood and said unto the Lord, Behold, Lord, the half of my goods I give to the poor, and if I have taken anything from any man by false accusation, I restore him fourfold. David was well acquainted with the law, but he failed to apply it to himself. Can I pause right here to make this teaching moment a preaching point? That is not enough for you to know the law of God. You must apply it to yourself. It's not enough for you to know that commandment six is you shouldn't kill. You need to acknowledge the sanctity of life. You need to make sure you're not guilty of character assassination through slavery slandering or bad mouthing or backbiting. You need to share the gospel instead of sharing the gossip. It's not enough for you to know that commandment seven is you shouldn't commit adultery. You need to be faithful. You need to say to your wife you love her. You need to show your husband that you love him. Why restrict whispering those sweet nothings and performing those romantic gestures to only when you were dating? Make sure and ensure that your marriage is honeymoon happy. It's not enough for you to know that commandment eight is uh, you shouldn't steal. Stealing is taking something from someone which doesn't belong to you. But why not do the opposite? Why not give to someone something which does belong to you? And I'm not just talking about financial assistance. I'm also talking about time and a listening ear and an encouraging word instead of selfishness you show selflessness. Instead of greediness, you show open-handedness. Instead of rapacity, you show generosity. And so instead of taking illegally, you are giving liberally. It's not enough for you to know that commandment nine is not bearing false witness. Don't just refrain from telling a lie. Tell the truth that you know. It's not enough to know that commandment 10 is not coveting. You need to be content and appreciative of what God has already given to you. It is dangerous when we know the law, but haven't applied the law to ourselves. We mustn't just know the truth. We must live the truth. We mustn't just have a head knowledge. We must have a heart knowledge. We must have the truth come into our hearts and live out his perfect life within us. This is not merely mental, it is experiential. 
Don't just be informed by the truth. Let the truth transform you. Can we go back to the palace? Uh, David has rightly judged uh, the prophet Nathan didn't need to instruct him in the law or inform him of the consequences of breaking the law. His verdict is correct. The parable has been told. David has been angered by this injustice. So now he can sense how God feels towards sin. It's now time for Nathan the prophet to speak directly to David the king, uh, regardless of whether he accepts it, rejects it, or neglects it. The truth still remains true. David, Thou art the man. There's silence in the king's court. It was like the prophet had held up a mirror to David. But instead of, of David getting mad at Nathan, David saw himself accurately for the first time in a long time. David was no longer concerned with his reputation for his character had been revealed. David could have actually and reacted irrationally, accusing the mirror of not working properly or charging the mirror of bearing false witness. But instead of challenging the mirror or threatening to destroy the mirror, David acknowledges that even though he doesn't like what he sees, that this is who he is. This is what he has become. It was Abraham Lincoln who remarked, the character is like a tree and reputation like a shadow. The shadow is what we think of it. The tree is the real thing. And whilst David is a shadow of himself, we can state it better than the 16th president of the United States of America, for reputation is what others think of you. Character is what God knows of you. David now knows what God knows, but he can see what God sees. He is the man, the man guilty of lusting, the man guilty of coveting, the man guilty of stealing, the man guilty of cheating, the man guilty of lying, the man guilty of denying, the man guilty of murdering, the man guilty of covering. The prophet of God declares, thou art the man. But Nathan didn't stop there. For the rest of verse 7 and all of verse 8, Nathan enumerates the blessings that God had bestowed upon him, that God had anointed you, David, as king over Israel. That's position. That God delivered you, David, from the hand of Saul. That's protection. That God gifted to you, David, the house of Saul. That's possession. That God allowed you, David, to take the wives of Saul. That's royal prestige and privilege. God also gave to you, David, control control over the house of Israel and Judah. That's power. When David was tempted, he should have been occupying himself with some mental arithmetic. We know he knows how to count sheep, but he should have been counting his many blessings, naming them one by one. Blessing number one, provision. Blessing number two, position. Blessing number three, protection. Blessing number four, possession. Blessing number five, power. Blessing number six, prestige. Blessing number seven, Heaven, a privilege, blessing after blessing after blessing. God has provided you with all these blessings, and still you break his commandments. In verse 13, the Bible records, David said unto Nathan, I have sinned against the Lord. And Nathan said unto David, the Lord also hath put away thy sin. Thou shalt not die. The sent prophet's assignment has been fulfilled. His task has been accomplished. Nathan the prophet has confronted David the king regarding his sin, and David has confessed. And because he has confessed, he receives another blessing from God, the blessing of forgiveness. For if we confess our sins, God is faithful and just to forgive us of our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. And so as the prophet turns to leave the royal courtroom, he offers his last words to David the king. The child also that is born unto thee shall surely die. Whilst David receives the forgiveness of his sins, he will now have to live with the consequences of his actions. David should have died. 
but the child born because of his sin would die in his place. Here is an innocent child born to die. And so because all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God, God, because he so loved the world, gave. This is God's gift. You do know that the name Nathan means gift. But this begotten son of the father, this son of David, is God's ultimate gift to a sin-sick world. For he was sent, there's that word again, not to condemn the world, but to save the world. John the Beloved, who first tells us in his gospel account that in the beginning was the word, and the word was with God, and the word was God, is the same John who tells us that God so loved the world. He's the same John who tells us no less than 24 times that Jesus is the one sent by the Father. He is the innocent child born to die. I can see him as the rich man, for he declares in Psalm 50 verse 10, every beast of the forest is mine and, and the cattle upon a thousand hills. I, I can see him as the poor man, for he said in Luke 9 verse 58, Foxes have holes, birds have nests, but the Son of Man have nowhere to lay his head. I can see him as the little lamb, for Isaiah 53 verse 7 says, he is brought as a lamb to the slaughter. But I also see him as that traveler who left his home, who's passing by. He says in Revelation 3 verse 20, behold, I stand at the door and knock. If any man hear my voice and open the door, I will come into him and will sup with him and he with me. And so here's my response, and I hope it will be your prayer too. I've looked in the mirror. I don't like what I see, but I'm opening my heart's door so Jesus can heal and cleanse me. If that's your desire, if that's your prayer, why not type in the chat, amen and amen. God bless you. Thank you so much, uh, Pastor McKenzie. Can you pray for us in closing? Our, our Father and our God, we want to thank you for Jesus. We recognize that we are sinners in need of a savior, in need of grace. And we thank you for making that provision. That whilst we were guilty, he was innocent. But we thank you for, for your love. We thank you for sending him. And we thank you, Father God, for, for not doing away with us, for, for giving us your grace and for extending your grace to us. Your grace is amazing. Your your grace is marvelous. And for that, we praise you. We thank you. We adore you. This morning, we have opened the door of our hearts. And this is our request, that you would come in today, that you would come in to stay now and forever. We pray that the character of Christ, the life of Christ, would be our experience and the experience of others as they encounter us. May Jesus be uplifted. May he be glorified is our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen.